Hey, it's Steve Rifkin, CEO of Loud Records. I'm here at Hot New Hip Hop. I mean, growing up in a musical family um, was interesting because not only was it my dad, it was my dad, my uncle, my two cousins, my grandfather. So we didn't have a whole bunch of music playing in the house. We had a lot of screaming in the house. Um, every family dinner, I think, ended up being like a meeting. I mean, <laughs> um, but it, 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 it was fun. You know, I, I didn't know if I really want. I thought I was going to be, I wasn't tall, but I thought I was going to be a pro basketball player. So, you know, while they were, you know, having, you know, a Friday night dinner or whatever family dinner, um, I would go out and shoot baskets. I really didn't give a fuck. <laughs> so then I think I was around 15 years old. My oldest cousin was head of sales of Polygram Records. And um, all Jews moved down to Florida. And my grandparents moved to Florida. And there was also a Jewish holiday. And there was a record convention at the Diplomat Hotel called the Narm Convention. And um, I went with my cousin, my father, and uncle. And that's when I decided I wanted to be in the music industry. It was cool, and just the respect that I saw my father getting as he was walking through, um, I was like, wow, this is, you know, there was no social media. Then. There was no social media even when I started, but the respect that everybody paid to him, I was like, all right, this is dope. Not that it was normal for me. I was, you know, at 13 years old, being bar mitzvahed, I didn't, you know, I, I was running around playing with my friends. I didn't even, you know... And I was that Jude that didn't even go to Hebrew school. Like, you know, they, I don't know how I got by mitzvah, but I did it in English. Um, but, I mean, it was what, I mean, everybody was there. Uh, Fat Papan was there. James was there. Earl Monroe was there. Um, Millie was there. Joe Simon was there. So, I mean, they were just there. So, when I was with my parents, I had to listen to WBLS. There was no other urban stations. There was no KISS. The, so no hot 97 so it was bls but when i was with my friends they weren't listening to bls my grandfather made the move for me by this time you know when i was 14 i just learned to, i was majorly dyslexic i didn't know how to read or write till i was 14 15 years old um so i was 18 years old and my grandfather called me down to florida and he said two things are going to happen to you you're going to end up in jail or you're going to end up dead and he goes why don't you do what randy did who was my cousin go on the road and visit some radio stations for your dad. Like marketing kind of. Exactly. So um, I did that. Well, he, my grandfather called my dad and my uncle, and they said, yeah. I was supposed to be gone for like three weeks, and I was gone for three and a half years. And that's how I ended up putting the street team together, because I was 18 years old, going to radio stations, visiting program directors and music directors. But they were my age now. I was like, what the fuck would I want to hang out with them for? So I, w I would end up going back to the colleges and talk music, talk sports, and talk about girls. It was never about money. It was always, you know, it was music, sports, and women. Word of mouth networking. Yeah, and I made them like, I didn't come with the name Street Team yet, but I said, all right, I'm going to keep on sending you records. Help me in this area. Help me in this area. So, you know, and then I know... In between that three and a half years, I was in Philadelphia and I met a guy by the name of Hiram Hicks. And um, me and Hiram became really, really cool. And like six months later, he goes, hey, I'm coming into town with, um, back to New York. He goes, I'm coming into New York. I'm with Mike Bivens from New Edition. He goes, you should meet him. So I was like, all right, we meet him. And, you know, six months later, you know, we're managing New Edition. Yeah, no, that was, that was, yeah, that was like, you know, from small letter A to capital Z. Yeah. I mean, th there was no bridge. Yeah. Um, I brought my father and uncle into it because, I mean, what do I know about putting a, a, a Madison Square Garden type tour together and yeah. putting an album together? Yeah, so I actually ended up moving to L.A. during that time um, for the Any Harpic album to help him make, just to make the record. But, you know, I was still a snot-nosed kid, you know, just running. I stopped getting into trouble and um, just learning about the business. So I kept my mouth shut, and I just listened. 
I reported it into my father, and just you know, and then whatever my gut, you know, I, he would let me. He would he would let me go. Like he let you know. That's the one thing about him. He would let the collar off me. The only thing that he didn't do was he would call me first thing in the morning. He goes, "How come you're not in the office?" I said, because I've been out till five o'clock in the morning, going to the clubs, getting these records, you know. So it was like he wanted me. To, I'm like, you know. So fi- and and we used to go at it that way, you know. It's like he wanted it to be a nine to six thing. I'm like, nah, man. I'm coming in at two, and I'll be out at two. Yeah. I was already into rap. Okay. Um, my fa- we put out the first rap record, Fatback Band, King Tim the Third. Pretty sure. Yeah, and then we gave Russell his first deal with um, Jimmy Spice and Dollar Bill, y'all. I loved, we were just talking about it. I, I just loved, forget about the Fatback record because it wasn't raw energy, you know. But the Jimmy Spicer record was just straight, raw, raw energy. And then what it was, and I could honestly say, like, don't forget, there were no cell phones, no pages. There was nothing at that time. But me and Russell would talk every single day, you know, and, you know, there's a station in Cleveland that broke the record. And the record spread from Cleveland, and then when it finally got back to New York, the record was a bona fide smash. So now we're not managing New Edition anymore. I'm in L.A. I got a girl. I needed to live and eat. And I saw a record that Delicious Final was putting out, and I called him, and um, the owner of the company was a guy by the name of Mike Ross, who had a partner, Matt Dyke. Um, and me and Mike had a lot of the same likings. You know, we both love ball, you know, music. And he was just a producer, but he didn't really know anything about marketing and promotion. So he gave, he gave me an office. You know, we crossed. I was still out of work records. And that's when the street team started really going into place. And the first record was Tone Loke. Wow. Thing. I had a best friend who was set of programming at MTV. You know, so that's how the Tone Loke video got, got on. And, you know, and then they started Yo! MTV, so I started the whole video promotion side of things, and people were paying me to help get their videos played on MTV. So I said, I'll start the Stephen Rifkin Company, named after David Geffen, the David Geffen Company. Each hit factor is different. You know, we could all look at this building over there. I'm going to say, what do you like about this building? Seven out of ten people are going to say, different things, maybe only 30%. So the it factor to, is what your gut is saying. Your gut is different than my gut. So, but Twister was the first artist, so everybody just knew the way he spit. So that was, but I mean, have it on Guinness Book of World Records, MTV, we did it live. I mean, Twister was the first, right? Then we had the Alcoholics, and then we had Woo, and then we had Mob, then we had Funkmaster Flex, Exhibit, um, Three Six Mafia, Project Pat. Did I say Flex? Yeah. Um, Flex. So X. Dead Prez. Dead Prez. We had a few misses too. Madcap. We had Raekwon as a solo record. We had Deck as a solo record. Oh, uh, uh, we had Little Flip was the last thing I signed before I left Loud. Um, we actually also ended up having Bone Thugs and Harmony when Easy passed. Fun. Then we had David Banner, Akon. Melanie Fiona, Asher Roth, Chantel, and Ray J. That's really what happened. That's pretty It's my 31st birthday. I've been trying to reach RZA, and um, he was Prince Rakim at the time. And I'm in the RCA building, and the receptionist says, you have a Prince Rakim. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Right? So he comes. He goes, the guys, you know, are in the lobby. Can they come up? I'm like, yeah, you know. The office that they put me in was a guest office. Was the size of this piece of paper on the, fl- you know, the on the floor. There was a desk. East Swift from the Alcoholics was with me. So the desk was here. There was a record player over here. Swift is sitting on the um, ledge, and these guys performed to "Protect Your Neck" in this space right here. And then the kid came <laughs> walking in through the door, says, "That's that shit," and left. And I never saw him again. Um. And they were signed within the week. So when Master P was blowing up, I went on a tour bus f- for two months. And I did literally the whole South. And I just didn't, un- I didn't understand. I understood how he was doing it. But I just wanted to get a grasp and touch. I was like, I got to find the next Master P. Yeah. 
and it, no, no matter what city I went into, everybody was talking about Three Six Mafia and Tether Club of Thugs. We let him keep on selling his mixtapes. So you gotta let artists operate how you, they were operating. Can somebody started. tell you to be? We want you to be like this person. Well, you that's got. Why I always question about the music industry. Yeah. So 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 it makes no sense. So you got to be you. I can't turn Luther Vandross, the rest in peace, into Young MC. It's like, you got to be you. Nobody could turn me into, oh, you should be this, or you should be. I'm like, fuck that. No way. You know, be you. Well, let, let, let me ask you a question. Sure. If I could help you get to a place, even if it's crossing the street, to a place where you want to go, don't you think it benefits me somehow, some way? At, at the end of the day, it's like, if I could help somebody, and if that person has any type of backbone or character, God forbid, if I ever need help, who'll be there for me? And I'm not talking financially. If it's making, hey, introduce me to so-and-so. Get me tickets for a show. What, what, whatever it is, it's not costing me anything to be nice to you. If M was signed to, if we did the deal with M, I don't know if he would have been the Eminem that he is today. Because my staff was all about still the street, the street, the street, the street. And Dre and M and Paul were smart enough that, hey, you mean they made just incredible records. The records that we made were for the street. So he would have still been a great MC, you know, but I don't know if he would have been headlining Coachella. Yeah. Uh, and then what about uh, same thing, but with Jay Z and Rachel Dow? Um, wanted it. I've known Dame since he's 15 years old, 16 years old. BMG wouldn't let me sign him. It wasn't necessary with rappers. It was, it was with, with, with me. We were at Sony, and um, Charlie Walk, who was head of promotion at the time, said to me, "I don't know any white people." And we were coming with a fourth quarter um, with every major artist that, that we had. And my wife was pregnant with my twins at the time. And I said, Charlie, I have two weeks. Set up every radio station. I have a plane. And I'll do seven to eight cities a day. And jumped on the plane, did seven to eight cities a day. And that was around a two to $300,000 expense. Um, I was always toying with the idea, but with a lot of... Um, we have a lot of anniversaries coming up. Capital Punishment will be 20 years Saturday. Wu-Tang will be 25 in, no in November. Then um, the Infamous will be 25 next year. And Sony wasn't really playing with the catalog. They weren't doing anything with the merch. You know, I used to own a piece of red. So I called a guy by the name of Tony Bruno, who is the GM of red. I said, why don't we try to do something like this? And they walked it up to Sony, Sony blessed it, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, we signed Axel Leon, you know, who's from here. And um, he was on the, you know, the Hip Hop Awards BET Cypher. Yeah. And the kid's just dope. It's going to be, um, it's going to be interesting. But, you know, I have three young kids, and I got a support, you know, that are really into social media. Yeah. That, will, that will help me. But we're still going to sign artists that are... Um, about the artist that has to be here five to ten years from now. Well, you know, th this is my thing, and, you know, people are going to get mad at what, what I'm about to say, but I blame a lot of the executives um, because nobody's developing talent anymore. If you're a producer and you're hot, a label's going to say, hey, I want you to do this record. You know, and it's like there's no more... The business is losing its creativity. Forget about if I think the rappers are great today, not great today... Every record is just sounding the fucking same. So back when I was starting, people would develop writers, people would develop producers, the artists, right? And the artists would work with this writer or that writer, and, and they would be like a, a, a unit together. But now it's just like motherfuckers just sit behind a desk, look at these charts, and now, you know, this guy has three records, you know, let's do another one. You know, let him produce so-and-so instead of being out in the field, being out in the studios, 
touching producers and developing producers, pro developing artists. And that's what I feel is missing with the music industry right this second.